Hey, uh, good afternoon. Um, I wanted to bring uh, together uh, initiatives uh, about sharing neighbor goods. Uh, we're especially focusing on sharing stuff with your neighbors uh, because everybody knows everybody has so much stuff at his home. It's a waste to buy new things. You can just share them uh, with your neighbors. Uh, I'll start by introducing uh, the two panels. Um, I have an extra chair. Uh, the guys from Chervoza and Paris, they couldn't come. If somebody feels uh, right to come up and wants to talk along, um, I'm also going to try to ask uh, you to ask a lot of questions. So uh, I want to interact uh, with all of you uh, to ask us questions about what we're doing. So uh, um, the first one I want to introduce is Camilla. We just recently met um, and she has started a platform in uh, Rio de Janeiro, Tem Ajucar, uh, for sharing uh, with people. And then afterwards, uh, Dan will uh, present what he's, uh, what he's been doing. Dan is the founder uh, and CEO of Peerby, uh, starting in Amsterdam, um, the first liquid platform of sharing stuff uh, with your neighbors. Uh, but he's going to tell you more about that uh, earlier. So Camila, go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm not Camila anymore. Right now I'm leaving since we changed yes, it, so right? <laughs> so um, I have a platform uh, for neighbors to share and donate things. Uh, it is in Brazil and we have been online for five months now. We have almost 50,000 users. And I'm really happy to be here and share experiences and uh, trade questions and answers. So thank you. Hello, my name is Dan Vettepoel. I'm the founder of Peerby. Peerby is a website and app that enables people to borrow the things they need from others in their neighborhood in 30 minutes. Um, we're live in all of the Netherlands and Belgium, in, in 20 cities in Europe and 10 cities in the US. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm really passionate about this space because I think it makes so much, so much sense, but it's still, it's so hard to really uh, achieve. So I, I look forward to this discussion. Yeah. So uh, I want to start first uh, by thinking about the, the collaboration um, of such platforms. Uh, the, the question, raising a bit the question, should it be a, a local network or should it be just a one global uh, network? Um, but first I want to ask both of you to uh, tell us a bit more about the next steps you see in your platform. Uh, so Camila. Uh, right now, we're uh, doing the second version of the website and also an app. So I think the the second st the the, n the steps that we're going now is basically to improve our, our system, and then um, I feel like uh, like what the community has been asking me is to have more interaction between the users, like offline, and this is something that I really want to do. So I feel like uh, creating spaces offline for people to really connect with their neighbors and do other types of collaboration, not just uh, sharing things. It's something that really moves my heart. You know, this is something that I really want to do. Okay. Uh, just maybe a little bit more about, so on your platform, there's a sharing of stuff. So I want to borrow a ladder. Somebody has a ladder for me. Uh, but there's also gifting on the same platform. Um, how do you think that it's an extra value to have these both combined? Yeah, well, um, actually what, what happens is like, we already have these systems that like put you in touch with your neighbor uh, so you can ask for something uh, as something borrowed or, or lending and then like why not to, to also be able to donate things, you know, because we oftentimes have like so many things that are unused in, at homes and they're there sitting in our living room looking at us, doing nothing, you know, like, what is this object looking at my face like this? What do you want from me? <laughs> you know, like, so why not, you know, use it uh, for someone who is really needing it. So um, I think it's, uh, it's, it, it's in the same uh, type of thinking, you know, it's not something really new to, to, to add the donation, the, the, the way it's already made, you know, it's just an extra, an extra step, step. Okay, thank you. Then Dan, can you tell us a bit more about what the next steps are for Peerby that you're uh, looking ahead? Um, I, I think that the, our space is still very much developing. So there is not a single uh, organization, uh, I believe, that has, has figured out the entire model. Um, we are really uh, happy that we figured out how to create a, a, a supply. So we have a, a huge amount of supply. We have about half a billion 
uh, dollars worth of products on the platform right now. Um, we also discovered that we had that we found ways to kind of launch this supply into new cities so that you're actually able to to you know borrow stuff. Uh, and what we're focusing on right now is to make this really easy, so to really help the um, you know the people that need products to to find them in a quick and easy way and make make it. Um, not just uh, a fun experience, but also make it a, a convenient experience so that people will really start to trust that they don't need to buy stuff that they can you know, just borrow, go to their neighbors and borrow it. Yep. It's all about relying on the network instead of uh, buying stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, Camilla, um, I want to ask, uh, first thing, you started in Rio. Uh, tell us a bit how, how the last five months have grown and how, it, how uh, you see that, that working. Um, and maybe a bit further down the continent or, or what are your, your plans on, on uh, the expansion? Okay. Um, well, in, in Brazil, I think we have uh, a different, a bit different reality from, from uh, countries in Europe and US where the sharing economy is, is more developed in terms of platforms and things like this. Uh, we already are a very collaborative people because this high social inequality m really makes people help each other, you know, but at the same time we also have a lot of competition because the, the mindset of having scarce resources, it's, it's bigger, you know. So I think uh, the main um, the main thing that, that stops us from sharing more things is uh, the trust issues. And here it's, it's easier to trust people, like you know, the, the justice work, the, the police works. In, in countries like Brazil or countries with uh, big social inequality, this is usually not the case. So you really have to, to create a lot of tools to, to help people really trust each other and, and make the first step, you know. So, uh, in Brazil, it, it has been have like a really big acceptance of the idea, and right now we're at this point where we're starting to to really like incentive people to to actually trade things, and there are already the pioneers who are you know like already open, trusted, trusting people, and but like the mainstream, I think they're still kind of like okay, let me see what this is. I'm not sure about it yet. So I think focusing on the trust is something big. And I think like if we can uh, really improve our platform so we can be more trusty, you know, uh, I think it could definitely go anywhere in Latin America or other countries maybe. Uh, I think from the South Hemisphere where this, um, the, the social inequality is bigger, I think could be something open to it, you know. Do you see some people um, saying that they want to be an ambassador for your, your thing? Do they take an extra role or an extra step? Uh, yeah, well, I haven't, um, I haven't uh, really started this program yet. I want to do an ambassador's program in each neighborhood. But I think uh, a lot of people, they didn't use this word, but a lot of people already came and said like, oh, I really want to bring this to my neighborhood. And we did the... the um, the online flyers which you can download and people have been like crazy putting in their buildings and talking to their neighbors and hey guys come to this platform let's share things so I think it is a great way and a fun way to to interact with your neighbors even the, the act of just inviting them to to come and, and join you so I think people were really excited about this so I think it's, it's going to be easy to find ambassadors you know. Okay, uh, I want to add a little extra. Um, I, uh, I started with a sharing platform three years ago uh, in Belgium and that was based on the demand. So we just showed, uh, no, not based on the demand, based on the offer. We just showed people what was available in their neighborhood. And then we got in contact with Dan, who was so uh, honest to tell us, let, let, let me tell you our biggest secret. And he did that to a lot of people. And uh, so we drove to Amsterdam, we had a really nice chat and he said, you should focus on the on the demand side of the market. Um, so that changed that totally changed the whole the whole thing. Um, and then well, we we uh, we decided to start working together, and um, we we kind of like work 
uh, independent in Belgium, but we have a, a very strong collaboration. We 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 find each other uh, in the same uh, with the same goals, so that was the easy way to just do it also. Um, but uh, Dan, I want on this, I want to ask a bit more. Uh, how did you uh, encounter people that want to ambassador for for PRB in, in other countries, and what were your experiences with uh, with these people uh, around the globe as you traveled? Uh? Mm -hmm. So I, I think building this this network um, is maybe one of the most challenging things. Uh, it's not because there's uh, we can't find people that love this idea. I mean, it's there's there's many many people that are passionate about it, that love it, that want to contribute. Uh, the hardest thing I think is offering the right tools uh, that they they can use to to really effectively uh, bring this to their to their neighborhood. And another thing, so so the tool we haven't not haven't developed fully developed the right tools yet to do that. Um, and another thing is that the model is still so much developing that. Um, you know, it's the, the question is, what are you an ambassador of? If it's you know, it, it it it's changing over time, and we're still figuring out what it is. Um, so it, it might be almost too early to uh, to to start spreading. I think it's good that we that we still have like local experiments that try to figure out what's the right way to do this, and then start spreading that. And then again, as you saying what they found and then uh, so in fact it, so as you did before you said that's the way it, it, uh, it already works better by focusing on the on the request side of the market uh, so you say we should all look in different countries uh, for new models and new ways to make people uh, actually do it more so the, the platform is there uh, it works in in Amsterdam in uh, yeah 30 minutes 85 uh, 50 uh, 85% of the requests are answered. So I'm um, bet it works, but not frequently enough. So um, so you're both suggesting that um, well, more collaboration between those platforms and finding that solution would be a, would be a good idea. That's a, that's a really hard question. Um, I, th I think, I th yeah, I think we ought to exchange knowledge, but at the same time, that's a very scary thing to do, right? Um, we, I, I, what's, what I find so interesting about the sharing economy that is on the one hand is about sharing and on the other hand it's still very much, uh, there's a strong competition between the different platforms. And um, a few years ago when I, I came to WeShare for the first time, I talked about what, what made our platform work because at that time I believe we were the only ones that were really creating a working system. And now I'm, I'm seeing that it's starting, you know, other platforms are starting to use the same methodology and it's working. And it's actually really scary to kind of, you know, that to, to, to share that knowledge and then see that others are using it, which is great. But it's also like you're kind of, feels like you're undermining your own um, company. So it's, it's, it's still, I think as a, as a human being, I have to develop and figure out how I, you know, what's the right balance for me actually in, so what do I share and what do I keep and where's, where, you know, is there a separation or is it, you know, is, should I share everything? Okay, Camilla, what are your thoughts on, on that? Uh, would you share it with the rest of the world if you found a way to make it even work better? Yeah, I think it's like, um, th 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 this question that you, you raised, this issue is something, I guess, um, in all this world of collaboration, it happens because I think that's the thing. We're still in a transition, so like we haven't figured out the ways how to, like I don't know, maybe financially man maintain those things that we're creating. So it's still like really scary to to make it like um, really something really open, you know. And I totally can can relate to this feeling, and. It is human, and we're still figuring out how to deal with this. And, and sometimes we, we have that extra courage, and we open ourselves to the abundance, and we give that extra step. And sometimes we hold it a little bit and feel scared, and like, oh my God, should I do this? Like, this is a, a question that um, definitely comes to my mind every time. Like, for example, uh, like the guys from Laboriosa, they were telling yesterday they are um, a co-working in Sao Paulo. 
and everything there is really open and like open source, open knowledge and everything. And they're like really brave people, but they, they are a, a community who does this together. So it definitely makes it easier, you know, because they know they have each other's back. And every time I think about, for example, like why don't you do a website that is like open source? This, this fear comes to my mind and at the same time it is um, a, a contra sense because I'm talking about abundance and not scarcity and at the same time I am I inside myself leaving the questions of scarcity you know so I think it's um, it's a it's a step that we collectively have to make and to support ourselves emotionally while we're in, in this transition to leave the, the the fear mentality and to go into the trust mentality you know okay um, yeah I just want already to, to look at the audience if there are already some questions or people who want to add something on uh, onto that. Uh, go ahead. Uh, hi, I just want to know how to how do you create trust? Um, like how do you bring trust to people who don't know your platform yet? How does it work? I'm sorry, who don't know the platform yet? Uh, well. Yeah. Um, how do you make people trust each other when they don't know each other? Of course. Um, I think there are uh, different tools to that and we're still experimenting them. But like, I think, for example, Airbnb, it's, it's really good at, at doing this, you know, like the rating systems and the, the, the review systems between users, like integrating with Facebook, for example, so you can know your friends in common with that neighbor. But in like in the in the bigger picture, I think the thing is, we can try to do like a setup of tools to to help people trust. But the final ultimate step, it's it's a, it's a matter of like not having that safety network. You know, you just gotta trust. But I find it interesting that um, every time the the subject of sharing things comes up, people come with the uh, issue of trust. And, but you know, on the other hand, uh, we are very trustworthy people. Like for example, I do know a lot of people here who have been using Tinder and went out with total strangers, you know, like, and you have no problem with going out with a stranger, but sharing something with a stranger, it is something more defined, you know? So this is a funny thing to, to think about, like what is the things that we are giving more value, you know, that we, we value the most, that we are afraid to lose, you know, I don't know. It's a, it's a, a thought that I have. Sh shall I, uh, I, if I can respond to the, to the trust question? I, I think the, the strongest mechanism uh, for generating trust is still human intuition. So we are, have been wired for, you know, tens of thousands of years to, to look at people, listen to people, and, and develop a certain feeling about whether we, we think they're trustworthy or not. And I think we do that in the first few milliseconds. Um, so I think all you need to do uh, as a platform is somehow try and translate these offline signals into something that you can show online. And that's, that's the big challenge. And I think it's, it's actually, um, it's gonna it's gonna be very hard to outdo that you know that classical system that's been working for ten thousands of years. So, uh, what we're doing is actually we're providing very little uh, trust systems. We um, but we do add communication. So there's a chat between people, and that I think that enables people to to get a feel for who they're talking to and whether they can can trust someone on like can, uh, just on a on a on a language level. You can already feel like by the type of words somebody is using who you're dealing with. And then what helps for, for hyper-local sharing platforms is that people are living uh, in the same street or in this, on the same block. So there's, there's a, a, common, a commonality there. And just the, the idea that you, you could walk down the street and, uh, and meet this person is already a strong driver for, for, for trustworthy uh, behavior. There's this issue I've been thinking about, uh, how we're now using technology to reconnect to each other, especially in big cities, we're so atomized that we need an app to actually get to know our neighbors. But I was just wondering if that is really reconnecting us or not. I mean, 
would it be better if I just knocked on the door of my neighbor? Or if I connect through an app, I might be talking to someone who has the same interests two blocks away, but I don't even know the old lady that lives right across from my, my house just because she doesn't, she's not online. So I, I, I don't think there's a strained answer, but how have you been seeing that happening in your own experiences? Well, I, I would highly encourage you to knock on your neighbor's door and say hi. Um, but I, I do think that technology is making it much easier to. Um, so le let's let's look. I, I'm a I'm a very evolutionary type of guy. So let's look back at how we are wired as human beings. I think we're wired to live in these tribes of maybe a few hundred people, and I think cities have created this immensely complex. Uh, uh, environment for us where there's millions of people and where like our old mechanisms uh, don't really work anymore you know we, 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 we can't deal with the amount of people in a city uh, that we just meet on a daily basis if we would actually stop say hi get to know every person that we see in the street we would go crazy probably or we spend all day saying hello um, so we have to find like new ways to kind of create these new tribes and I, I think technology is helping us to kind of rediscover uh, a very you know old and very natural way of of being together um, and that is kind of you know uh, uh, re reconnecting us to that uh, on, a, on, a, on a virtual level that is kind of goes above the city and is creating these virtual tribes for us so I think it's it, to me it feels like an, a, a very natural and, and healthy thing to do, actually. And I think it's creating more connections and more local, really real offline uh, uh, experiences than, than, than that it's, it's breaking anything. Uh, I personally feel like um, in a practical way, like of sh uh, sharing things, uh, it, it is more practical, like instead of knocking on 20 doors, you already know which door has something that you need. But in the way of like getting to know our neighbors, like um, creating really the, this community sense, uh, I feel it's like we have been um, so much uh, separated from the, the thought of interdependence, you know, like we were raised in this independent setting, like you have to be independent, that's the, the, the base of our success, you know, if you have money enough, you can be independent enough and not rely on anyone. So like shifting this mindset is something that it's like so much already in our DNAs, you know, so I feel like the technology, it is kind of like a small step towards a bigger step that it's like just breaking the ice, you know, for example, instead of uh, getting, I don't know, a baby that has never swimmed in an ocean before, the, the technology could be like a swimming pool, you know, like you take him to the swimming pool until he learns how to swim and then he puts his feet on the water, on, on the ocean, and then he dives and then he goes out until the point that he's going to be swimming in the ocean, you know. So I think uh, these platforms, they, they kind of can, can really help to break the ice of, I'm not sure if I should talk to this neighbor or not, but it's like, it's a first step towards something bigger that I think it will happen soon, you know. Okay, thank you for that. Anybody else wants to? Yeah, I'm just coming, I'm coming over. I think you uh, mentioned something about offline possibilities in, in areas where um, inequality is similar. I'm uh, about to embark on this adventure where I'm moving to the Eastern Cape in South Africa where there's a lot of poverty um, and people, although it's very tribal, don't speak to each other anymore. And I was wondering if how you would implement the, because they don't have any internet, they basically don't have any water or food. So I was thinking of how I can contribute to their community in that way of living in the Southern Hemisphere because it's so different from anything that I've heard here so far. It's a very different game that we're yeah. playing down there. Yeah, well, offline systems, I think, like, here in Europe, they have, like, great ideas that could easily uh, be settled in anywhere, and they're really cheap. Like, for example, the pumping pipe uh, stickers where you can put in, in y your 
uh, mailbox so people can know what you have to share with them. You know, so you can have a sticker of a, a bike and maybe a vacuum cleaner and the things that you can, uh, that you physically let people know that you have that to share with them. And also there are some great ideas of um, putting like boxes in, in the street where people can leave whatever they want and take whatever they want. They have done this experiment in Brazil recently and it was like really beautiful. They did it, this in one whole street. They put a bunch of boxes in a Sunday morning and the day that people are usually with their families going to the park or something like this. And then they would, you know, look at with curiosity, like what is that? And then they start to understand the game, how it works. And then they go back home and pick up the things that they have left and put it there and people start to trade. So this, this could be like a fun uh, experience. And also uh, there are, a, a lot of this is happening in Brazil. It's like um, fairs where you can go and just bring whatever you have to donate to people and you can take whatever you want. So people will just go there and leave a bunch of stuff that it's uh, not in their house that they're not using. And you can just pick whatever you want, but you do not need necessarily to leave something in order to pick. You just do whatever you feel like. So these are good ways, I think. Um, I, I, there's many different countries in Africa and many different circumstances, but um, the, the, your, your question makes me uh, uh, think about a story that our, our head of community told me. Uh, she grew up in, uh, in Mali, and uh, what she told me is basically the, the behavior that we are now trying to introduce through technology for, for the, for was very normal for the villagers uh, where she where she grew up, uh, personal belongings were shared. Uh, if someone had a car, then you everybody could use that car. Um, so um, it could might well be that you that the the offline infrastructure uh, is actually is is already there, and, and they might be much better actually at at doing this stuff than than we are. Um, and another interesting thing that I, I, we're, we're seeing that a lot of developing countries are, are leapfrogging all kinds of technologies. So uh, digital payments, the, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure, I think it was Kenya, but I'm, I, I, I could be wrong. But the, the digital payments through cell phones were really uh, pioneered in, in, in a number of African countries. And still they're, they're very far ahead of actually of the micro uh, transactions and micropayments uh, as compared to to Europe and the US and that. Yeah. Just one more look around if some other people have uh, some questions. Okay. Um, hi, thank you, that's awesome. Um, I just wanted to know, it's, it's really hard to scale up and I've heard that uh, Ten Asuka went uh, in five months reached f to 50,000 users. And being a technologist myself, I know how hard it is uh, given that there are so many social networks and, and other systems are competing. What were the strategies you used in order to achieve so many users? And, and also in your case, um, how do you do it? Is this like traditional advertising? Or oh, I don't know, just give us some data. Yeah. Well, it was uh, very organic and we were really inspired by uh, PeerBee's idea. Actually, we were a platform like really inspired on PeerBee. These guys are like the pioneers. They created the whole thing. Nobody invents anything, you know, we just hack and the, the things that are existing. So they had this amazing system of like unblocking your neighborhoods, like you need a number of people to unblock it. And the only thing to unlock the neighbors, I'm sorry, and th so you can use the platform. So what we did, we just uh, lowered the number because we saw that was um, more compatible with our reality in Brazil. So to unlock a neighborhood, you would need uh, 30 people. W this is how we started. Uh, so you can use the platform. And actually we saw that this is a, a really high number actually. So now we, it is 13 people. But we're still figuring out how good is it because like, uh, in a good way, you create the critical local mass uh, to, 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 to do the trade. You need this network local. 
but at the same time, it is still a low number, uh, so things can happen more, the more trades. So we're still figuring out how this number is. And, but I think uh, the, the thing about the, the scaling up, I think it has to do with the fact that we're a country in the, si the size of a continent. You know? So I think uh, if something there um, goes into one of the mass media things, like it just go to the, goes to the whole country, so it, it is easier. No. I, I think um, uh, storytelling is a is a big part of of getting the yeah, getting the story out there. Um, this is new behavior. This is n this is a new reality. It's a new experience, and um, that makes it, it, so it's it's news in a sense. And the press, if you're able to tell the story in a in a good way, the press loves to to you know uh, uh, to write it down or to show it on on TV or on the radio so that for us was a was a big driver uh, free publicity and um, and then there's you know people need to spread the word so we're trying to create as many ways as possible for uh, you know people that that, that enjoy their have had a good time doing this to spread it to uh, to others but we're, we're still figuring out how to do it um, and then on the there's also a technological side to this. It, if, if you cannot use the platform, you're not going to have a, a great experience, right? If there's nobody around you to share with, so you need to figure out mechanisms to you know go from zero to uh, a small community pretty fast. And um, I've seen many marketplaces that came up with that that didn't do the di didn't do the math for their particular marketplace. So they, they didn't realize that the model they set up would require like 10,000s of people to join the platform because they, before they would have any functionality. So that means that you know, the first 10,000 people are not gonna be able to use it. Um, so there's no reason for them to really sign up or do anything, because it's just non-functional. So you have to really have to lower the limit to, to yeah, to make it as to make it function as soon as possible with a very low number of people. Yeah, and also just uh, adding something um, on what you said about storytelling. I think uh, this is something uh, really new as a shift of paradigm, and it's something that we we tried to do with Tenasuka. Uh, that is really telling how amazing this type of behavior is, but through an emotional place, you know, because like usually when we're talking about sustainability and things like that, we always get in the, in the rational side, you know, I, I should do this because this is good for the planet. And, blah, blah, blah. and then now I think what we're starting to do is like, why can't we make this like fun, you know, like fun and with a nice communication, something visual that it's cute and, and it, it really touches you in a different place, in a place like, oh, this is such a, I don't know, such a sweet thing to, to be doing with someone who lives close to you. And I think uh, the more um, we can, I don't know, make those type of initiatives that we have been talking about in this festival very, uh, s very digestible to, to people, you know, it, it is better, you know, we, we, because I think there is also always a concern of like, oh no, they should reach our uh, level of consciousness so they can do things that are nice for the planet. There is, I think, this mentality of um, they're not good enough for doing this. And we have to be very inclusive in, in our communication, like we have to you know, help people to do this thing that it's, it's really hard, you know, like uh, it's very, um, it, it go against our, our, our beliefs that we were raised with. So it's hard it's for, for people to, to do this move. So we have to really get in somewhere that it's fun. Like Disco Soup yesterday, they were talking. They're talking about like uh, no, no food waste by making a party and people like chopping things and then making a soup. This is so much fun. And I think that the, the more we can uh, join like good actions for the planet and for the people with fun experiences, like this is the, for me, this is the paradise, you know? <laughs> okay, I, I wanna turn a bit back to the, to the initial question. Uh, suppose that, that uh, someone finds the trick 
to do uh, to make the platform more and more liquid and people request more stuff. Um, uh, platforms are now uh, local, in, uh, let's say in, the, in Belgium and, and, and Holland and, and America. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> yeah, but, um, and now in, in Brazil. Uh, suppose that you find it. Um, how would it, if it scales globally, uh, would it then remain uh, a centralized structure or would it, do you both see it as a more decentralized structure uh, in, in, in different regions and, and how big should that uh, decentralization be? Yeah, that's, a, that's another tough question. Um, so I would love to uh, be able to, to crowdfund our, our next uh, financing. Um, but if I look at the amount of money that we need to to build a platform like this, I have not seen crowdfunding of that that kind of size. So the it seems that there you know that is lagging behind uh, that you know the, the crowdfunding technology or crowdfunding abilities are still lagging um, when it comes to um, supporting you know, organizations that are really reaching a certain size. And um, and I think that's that's weird because it's, so you, it's there, there's one foot in like the old economy, one foot in the new economy, and we're trying to figure out how to um, you know how to deal with that sort of imbalance and how to how to kind of combine all those visions and, and ideas into one uh, company. I, I do hope that it will you know the crowdfunding will grow in such a way that I'll be able to actually. Uh, uh, crowdfund in, a, in maybe in a few years and make make the, the 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 members of the platform also the owners. But I I have not seen you know the uh, really successful examples of that happening yet to to bigger companies. So I I sure hope that it's gonna happen. So for you, the crowdfunding or the way to raise money is key to uh, being able to be decentralized because the cost is too big otherwise uh, to put it in place first. Um, yeah, building a platform like this is, um, like the idea is very simple, right? Sharing stuff with your neighbors, how hard can it be? But then once you start building a platform, you discover that two-sided marketplaces, because that's what it is. It doesn't sound romantic, but it's a two-sided marketplace. Building that is one of the most complex problems on the internet. So it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of money to build it. and then. Once you've built it, you need to reach a very big amount of people to actually, you know, find a sustainable way of, of supporting the platform financially. So it takes a lot of uh, money to do something very local, which is it's this weird contradiction. But um, I, I, I believe we we could not have done this without, you know, the the, the team that we have. We're like we're 25 people now, and we everybody is super busy trying to make this work. So, you know, we, 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 we still need uh, some food on the table. So, yeah, we, we need financing. Come yeah, on. well, I, I think it's, um, I think maybe, like, um, it will have both, you know. I think it w there will be, like, big um, platforms that are doing this, and they're important because they're, like, bringing this new story. But I think also um, there is an, uh, an adjustment to a local reality in terms of language and uh, the way of communicate, the, uh, in, in their own culture, the, the way that people do things, that it's really hard to get something and do like a copy paste for, for every place, you know? So I think uh, maybe, I think it, it can be adapted to different realities, a big platform, it, if it has maybe a, a neutral uh, central base that can be like custom made for for each place where it is put at. So maybe this could be a, a way of doing it. Mm, can I look into the crowd again? Is there still other questions? Yes. Yeah, it's okay. Hello. Um, I was just wondering what your stories before the platform are. What did you do and what moved you guys to do what you do now? Sure. Um, it's funny, we have, we have a bit of a similar story in, this, in some of the parts. Anyway, I'll tell my story. Um, in, um, 
I think the, what, what really started a shift in my thinking uh, is when in, in 2009, uh, my life changed dramatically. So my, my house burned down, uh, my relationship ended, my job ended. Basically, I lost everything that at that time I attached my, my ego to. And I had to let go of all that stuff. I had just had to accept that I, I was me and that was all I got. And I discovered that you know, because I had to deal with that, I discovered that the, I, I had to think about what's really valuable in, in my life. And the, I discovered the, the only thing that really mattered was the people around me and being able to, to connect to them. Uh, and I also discovered that, these, that people love helping because this was the first time that I kind of had to open up and ask for help and say, hey, I don't have anything, I don't have a home, I, I don't know what to do, I'm heartbroken. Um, and then, you know, and then people love to help out. They're really, it's, it's, it's really great to, 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 to have a, a meaning in someone else's life. And by asking a question and opening up that, like that, you're offering opportunities for other people to, to have a meaning in a sense. And um, so that changed my vision on, 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 on life. And it took many more years before I actually started to kind of implement that in technology, but it's, I think it's, it's what's driving me um, as a human being, yeah. <laughs> um, with me personally, it was, um, yeah, I think it was a setup of things. It was not one thing only, but, um, I was this really confused lost girl, you know, like I did like two years of law school, couldn't find myself in it. I did modeling for a few years and then I did like, I was doing acting college as well. I was like such a mess, you know, I was like this person that doesn't finish anything that it starts. And I was like, oh my God, so worried about my professional life. Exactly one year from, uh, from now before the last year, uh, I was in Schumacher College doing a course with Charles Eisenstein called Voices for the Earth. And I was like, what the hell am I doing in this planet? I have no idea. <laughs> and I really, I couldn't find my purpose. I already had the, the, the idea when I went there, but it was still something that took me a courage to do. And then what happened is like, that made me really do the website was because um, I started to to understand alternative ways of doing economy. I did a course called Gaia Education. That it's a course that has globally. It's really good for um, making designers in sustainability. And in this course, I really it was almost to me like a total shift in paradigm. I saw that the whole story that I've been told about how uh, life works, how uh, work, uh, profession, relationship, everything uh, that was told to me, uh, there was an alternative way of seeing that. And, and this is when I found, uh, find, found out about uh, sharing economy. And when I get in contact with this type of initiatives, one of them was PRB, I said, this has to be happening in Brazil, I, I have to do it. And I, I was at, at first looking for someone who was already doing it. And then I couldn't find and I said, okay, so I'm just gonna have to do it myself. <laughs> okay, so let's start. And, but I had no idea it would be this big. I, just, I was like really this innocent person thinking, oh, I'm just gonna pay some money and the website is gonna run by itself. Like I had no idea. <laughs> it was, it's, like, it's like a baby needs a lot of nurturing, you know? So yeah, that was it. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, last question. That was a really good one. <laughs> I think we'll have to wrap it up here. Uh, just looking for one more question or? No, we'll have to wrap it up. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.